Okay, guys, I'm going to step in and out of frame so that uh, Leland can see me when I'm talking on the microphone, and then after that, I'm going to step back. My name is Jeff Struker. Thank you so much for being here for this forum. Um, what we're going to do in just a second is I'm going to give the guys that are on screen and in front of you an opportunity to in, uh, describe themselves just a little bit. I'm going to give you guys a time limit because when preachers get a hold of a microphone, man, it goes long. Um, We'll do a few questions that we've kind of talked about ahead of time that we think church planners really, really need to know. And some of these questions you may already have on your mind, but the goal is to give a lot of time at the end so that you can ask questions of these experts up here. Um, before we get into it though, I just wanna uh, say thank you for being part of this conference this week. So proud of Jim and his hard work uh, for making this whole thing happen and for Southeastern Seminary and the uh, desire to uh, reach the military community and raise up uh, um, disciples who will go out and make more disciples. So thanks to Dr. Aiken, but specifically thanks, Jim. If you guys don't mind, just give him a, a hand for his hard work. <clears throat> So Leland, we're going to start with you in just a second. We're going to spend like two or three minutes. I'd like for you to get to know the folks that are part of this panel so that maybe you have a question that's directed at somebody up here um, particularly. And what, what I'd like for you to do is just tell us who you are, give us a little bit about your background and the context where you're ministering right now. So Leland, if you don't mind, you can get started and then we'll just go through the panel right here um, all the way down to Chaplain Lee on the end. Go ahead. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Leland Stevens. I am uh, video conferencing in from a place called Vicenza, Italy, and it is home to the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Um, it's in northern Italy, about 45 minutes away from Venice. So that'll give you a little bit of uh, geographical context. My family and I, um, I retired from the Marine Corps back in 2014, went to seminary, and then about uh, Two years ago, we landed in Italy to plant the church. Uh, we launched officially April 1st of last year and uh, just been rocking and rolling out here ever since. Great. Thanks, Leland. Go ahead. Hey, guys. My name is JD. Uh, I am a pastor, uh, one of the pastors at Pillow Church in Jacksonville, outside of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Um, I have been a part of probably four or five uh, church plants around military installations over the last 15 years, and so that is uh, why I am up on the panel. There you go. All right, my name is Justin Woods. Uh, I work for NAM full-time at the Naval Academy doing collegiate uh, evangelism. About seven years ago, I've been there 10 years, about seven years ago, we like, we need another Baptist church. So me and a couple friends called all of our friends and planted another Baptist church. And then one of the guys on my staff, we sent him out from that church plant to plant another one about two years ago. And then almost the same time, the Lord took me away from the one we planted. Uh, I was never the lead pastor there, but um, took me away. I've been the interim pastor at another Baptist church, kind of a little outside of town, more revitalization, dying church. Um, and I uh, helped see that one come to fruition to be merged with the one that we first started. That merge happened last week. And so uh, now I'm don't not a pastor anymore. So uh, that's kind of a little bit of a history and I'm a reserve chaplain. So I feel like I kind of hit the trifecta of things, so. So I'm Barry Murray, and uh, I'm maybe the odd person here. I, I don't have a military background, and uh, planted in New England in 2000 uh, in Maine, and uh, was there for 18 years. I uh, worked for NAM the last six years as church planting catalyst for the state of Maine. And uh, long story short, we were praying, really felt like the Lord was calling us to plant again, figured it would be New England, and then um, kind of just started having some conversations, met Marty, who's here in the room, and he was uh, looking to plant near Fort Bragg. My wife and I prayed, and just through listening to the Lord, we felt like he was calling us to be a part of what God was doing here. So we're super excited to be there, um, just kind of trying to figure out kind of what it looks like to, to plant a military church in a community that's really kind of grown up um, in the area that we're at. It used to be rural, and now there's about 50,000 people um, about eight miles north of Fort Bragg. 
Uh, my name is Brian O'Day. I uh, did 10 years active duty in the Marine Corps and felt like God was calling me out to start a church. And so I started a church in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And it was puttering along until uh, Jonathan Davis showed up with his experience. And uh, now it's going well. Um, and uh, so um, the uh, so I work right now, I work half time as a pastor at the church. And then I also work half time with uh, a little organization called the Praetorian Project. Uh, Praetorian Project is a family of churches that is planting churches near military bases around the world. Uh, started out predominantly towards Marine Corps, uh, but we're expanding to uh, reach other services as well. Uh, nobody else has talked family, but we have lots of kids here. Uh, I'm married and have five kids, and all these guys have lots of kids too, I think. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Endel Lee. I am the church planning catalyst uh, for military communities with Northern North American Mission Board. I've uh, been in that role uh, just about five years, uh, have a significant uh, military background, um, enlisted Marine for five years, Marine officer for six, uh, and then been doing Navy chaplaincy for about uh, 20, 26 years now. So you do the math on that, uh, that's a little over 37 years. Career reservist, but it's accumulated about 10 years of uh, active duty with mobilizations and various other uh, responsibilities in the midst of that. Uh, was uh, my home's in Alabama, no matter where I lay my head. So I like to tell people that's a good country song if you hadn't heard it. Uh, and I have a wife and uh, two boys. They're grown now out of the home, 29 and 26, a couple of grandkids. So we're, uh, uh, I tell people that uh, I really live in hotels and rental cars most of the time, but all my family, my stuff are there uh, in Mobile. I uh, grew up in Alabama and then had a uh, jaunt in Texas uh, and then moved back to New Orleans, was teaching there at New Orleans Seminary uh, when this lady, Katrina, came to town. Put a right turn in our life we didn't see. Uh, wound up with the North American Mission Board doing disaster relief spiritual care for a number of years. Um, and after I came back from uh, a deployment to Africa, uh, Doug Carver and, and Kevin, those guys, talked to me and said, hey, uh, we would like for you to, to, to think with us. Uh, about this whole venture of church planting in military communities. Uh, they wanted to be more intentional about that. Some of the Praetorian Project stuff momentum had started, uh, and they were looking at how do, how do we become more intentional about that. So it's been exciting over the last five years to really see what God has done with that. If you ask me my title, I tell people I'm a dotologist. Okay, so I find the dots, study the dots, try to connect the dots where I can, and most of the time I just stay back out of the way and let God do what he's doing. And that's what you see here is God manifesting himself through dots all over the world. This is, this is global in its scope. And uh, as you appreciate that today, I hope that will be exciting to you uh, as we venture. So I'm going I'm to shut up and let these guys talk because they're really the experts at it. Okay, so this is for Leland as much as for everybody else in the room. I, I want you to point I want to point out, so you have a lot of church planting experience here in front of you. You have some missionary and military community church planting experience that's dialed in right now from Vicenza, Italy. You've got a lot of chaplaincy experience, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Chaplain Doug Carver, uh, Chaplain Major General Doug Carver's in the room with us too. So there's a lot that you can learn today about chaplaincy. Um, I'm going to field the first question to everybody on the panel. Leland, you don't have to wait or you don't have to look. You can just jump right in there and don't worry about interrupting everybody because we know there's a one or two second delay. We'll take care of the delay on our end. First question for everybody in the panel is, what's unique about planting a church in a military community? I have some specific questions about the challenges or the opportunities that go along with that, but just paint the picture for everybody in the room who doesn't understand a military audience or a military town. What's unique about ministry in a military town? Anybody? So I'll speak to that as someone who's not necessarily never been full-time military. Um, learning the vernacular, that is central uh, for the last uh, probably 15 years, the last three primarily. I have been learning the lingo of the Marine Corps, and uh, it is a language in and of to itself, and it's been really helpful to uh, meet with guys as I disciple guys and as they tell me who they're affiliated with in nomenclature. Uh, to ask what that nomenclature is, to expound on it. So I understand that when somebody else tells me they're also uh, in that uh, company or uh, whatever, battalion, whatever it looks like, uh, then, then, I'll, then I know that, um, that I can connect the dots, as Endel was saying, and, and, and put people together. So for me, it's learning the vernacular. That's, that's been the unique 
uh, challenges and all that stuff we'll get into, but that's unique for me. That's someone that's uh, not been in the Marine Corps, for sure. Yeah, I, I think, and we'll talk, I'm sure, about this, and we've talked about it a little bit this morning, but just the coming and going. Uh, and a lot of you are com very much aware of it. And it's true in cities. It's just true in our 21st century culture. But uh, there's just so much coming and going. I think a lot of times we talk about the uh, the cycle of moves. And so, hey, you only have people for three years. You know, that's usually kind of what we're thinking three years is we have somebody. Somebody was talking on the panel this morning, though. Man, sometimes they don't get to your church till they've already been in town for six months or a year. So uh, one of the things we're trying to do is shorten the uh, church search uh, time period. But uh, so if you have somebody for three years, the service member, especially I, I, we're there near second Marine expeditionary force. So huge fighting force, uh, fighting Marines, fighting service members. So same thing, 82nd airborne over at Fort Bragg and those types, they are there half of the time. They're there half the time. So, okay, I've got them three years. That may only be two years and they're only going to be there half of the time. Uh, so they'll be there half of the Sundays. They'll be there half of the weeks where I can meet them for discipleship. So just understanding the the transient nature, but also the the deployments, the training, they're, they're there half the time. But the family's there all the time. Hopefully. Anyone else? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chime in here. That, uh, something that as I talk to uh, folks that are considering church planting uh, in military communities, I'll say you need to understand this is a different ball game than church planting in other arenas. Uh, and it's related to what Brian has talked about here uh, with the move and the transitions. Uh, this is a very expeditious kind of uh, population. Uh, transit is another word that's used. Uh, so I tell them, you got to put your foot on the gas pedal and not take it off. Uh, other church plants, they'll go in, and, and Barry may be able to talk about this. You'll go in and establish yourself, build some momentum, grow, and at about the two- to three-year mark, uh, you're looking at either this thing's going to sail, it's going to take off and get an upswing to it, so slow, steady growth, or it's going gonna, it's gonna to pitch, and you're going to know, okay, it's probably not going to make it. With uh, church planting in military communities at the two- or three-year mark, and stable, instead of it being the stabilizing point, everybody's leaving. All right, and, and all those folks that you built relationship with in that first two or three-year momentum that would be your base, suddenly they're getting PCS orders and they're shooting out to other locations, which is great if you've discipled them and have a missional posture, then you're sending out disciples and, and great places to plug in and, and create new works and those kinds of things. But if you haven't anticipated that, you're going to be in trouble. And the grief that comes along with that, the emotional uh, dynamics that are there, and I, and I find the spouses actually experience this more. The the, the ladies encounter this uh, uh, ch challenge, if you will, in greater ways. So that's one of the things I think that's unique from ordinary church planting, if you if we can call it that. The the uniqueness that we've talked about is, you know, the there's there, and when you're running races, there's the sprinters, the middle distance runners, and the marathon runners, the distance runners, and the sprinters get all the glory. You know, they look good and they're pretty, and they shot out there really fast. They get the records. The marathon runners of the of the pastors that just keep going. They're so admirable. But no one ever talks about middle distance. You never watch it because they're the hardest runners who then throw up when it's over and nobody cares. That middle ground of you have to go all the time, no matter what, is basically what military ministry is. We're the middle distance runners of the ministry world. And it's the most gut-wrenchingly difficult because of the constant churn. And I find that my foot has to be down all the time. It's like when you're running a 400, you don't have a loafing part of it. You just hit it, and then you throw up when you're done. So that's kind of how I view it. That's what happened to you, Barry. That's what you were doing. Okay. Um, so now I've got a couple of specific questions for specific panel members based on their background. The first question is for um, Brian. Uh, Barry, sorry. Uh, Barry, you mentioned that you don't have any military experience. So I'm going to put this in air quotes. Do If you're going to plant a church in a military town, do you need military experience? Or does it help or hurt to ha have or not have military experience? Give us your perspective on this. Well, we've been there less than a year, and we're five and a half months out from launch. So jury's still out on that question. But, uh, yeah, I mean... I 
I think the short answer is yes, that God, God is, uh, he uses people um, from all backgrounds to reach people in different cultures. And uh, so I would say that this is a cross-cultural endeavor for our family to, to meet and reach people with the gospel who are, are military. And uh, we, we moved to Maine in 2000 from North Carolina. I thought New Jersey was as far north as you could go. And this is way more cross-cultural to move from Maine to a uh, nearby military base and live in a neighborhood with 80% of the families in the military. This is way more cross-cultural. Uh, like J.D. said, learning the language, um, you know, and just, it just knowing that you're going to be an outsider in some form or fashion as long as you're there. And uh, so that's just kind of what you have to, to recognize. But God, you know, from the beginning of time, he uses people to go into cross-cultural places. And so uh, team is huge. You got to have people on your team that are military people who can go in and, and reach people that you'll never reach. And so uh, when we landed, it was total parachute. We didn't have a team. And we prayed like crazy, and God has just started to put people on a team around us that are, you know, it's crazy how strategic God is when you pray, and and He just lands people with you. And so, um, I think that's a huge piece. And strategically, I think the key is is just like any other uh, church planning situation. You go in and you pray and say, "All right, God, send us people of peace that can connect us to people in in ways you know, like Lydia, like the Samaritan woman." Um, and, and that's, that's what we need. And so for me to plant a church in a military community is something only God can do. Uh, that's true every time, but, but in this situation at 49 years old, and I've been in church planting for the last 20 years of my life, uh, I'm in a place of like, God, if you don't do this, then, then it's the ship's going down. So. Anybody else want to add to this question or you want to offer some advice there? Do you need to have military experience to plant a church in a military town? I'll offer this advice because I was not full-time military. So um, uh, as someone that went into Pillow Jacks and uh, was very much an outsider, the church is at that time was probably 95% Marine Corps at that time. And so for me, it was, it, it, I felt like an outsider going in. And so you can do it, though. Like, you can break down the barriers. The gospel is what breaks down those barriers and binds us all together. And so whether you're military, whether you're a student here at Southeastern or a student in University of NC State right down the road, like, the gospel is what connects us to, to those students and to those military members. Yeah, it's, it's a question that should not have to be asked on this campus, right? Can the gospel go from one culture to another culture. Yes and amen, right? Like if it can't, then let's take the go off of everything and just stop. Yes, the gospel can go from one culture to another culture on the backs of people from this culture that have the gospel to the backs of those who don't yet have the uh, gospel. And so, yes, you are crossing culture. I don't think it's a people group. It is a culture, um, but it is very unique culture. Um, but yes, people can cross culture with the gospel. Okay. Now I'll, uh, I'll add one thing if I can. Um, you know, the uniqueness to being overseas that that's a little different. And so in an overseas community, the military environment or the military culture is embedded in a different culture, typically completely different than the American culture. And so their gathering spot, unlike in a North American context is actually that base, that post. And so if you can't have access to them in the initial phases, so we're past the initial phases, we just brought on a, uh, a second pastor, he has no military experience, but to start meeting people, you have to somehow have access to their gathering spot. Everyone here in North America, they're out in the communities. They leave the post or leave the base. In my context, it's a little bit different. And I, I agree that the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants to do. And I will say from a practical perspective, having access to the base in a overseas context does seem to be something that is important. 
Okay, thanks, Leland. I'm going to jump around a little bit because I have a question that is almost the exact same question, and it, this is I'm going to uh, pitch it to Brian first, but anybody else who's got some input, please join in. How does a church planner who maybe doesn't have any military experience get access to families? You've just heard from Leland, who's over in Vincenza, Italy, but let's say it's here in a large military town here in the United States. How do you get access to the warrior? We're going to call them warriors just for the sake of not going through the whole military every time we talk. So how do you get access to warriors? How do you get access to warriors' families? Brian, you start us off and anybody else who wants to jump in there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for pastors and ministry leaders of churches, if you get access, uh, at least this is how it is in our base, and I think most uh, base and posts posts that I'm aware of, is the base chaplain or the garrison chaplain can give you a contractor badge to get on base. And so there's there's a way to get from the gatekeeper, from the chaplain, the base or garrison chaplain, to allow access to the base uh, for ministers. Uh, So a lot of times that can happen. Uh, The other one is what Leland was just talking about. There are, uh, the service members leave the base. Sometimes they are itching and scratching and clawing to get off the base. And so trying to meet people once you do so, and you really only have to meet a few. They usually come and go in packs. And so uh, really just meeting a few. Uh, I'll tell you one couple, Mike and Michelle DeLarge, uh, have never served in the military. They're members of our church and they showed up to our church and met them the first Sunday. And I said, we're here. We just moved into town. We feel like God has called us to minister to Marines, young, single Marines. I'm like, Man, that's awesome. Uh, Great. Literally, the next week, they showed up with four of them. The next week, they showed up with like six of them, and then they started a Bible study in their house, and they're actually reaching these guys. I'm like, hey, Mike, did you ever get access to the base? He's like, no. I was like, how are you reaching these Marines? He's like, they're all over the place. I live in Jacksonville. And so some people do it, and some people don't do it. And so just somewhere inside, there's a fire in the belly to go reach service members, or there's not. And so I think sometimes it's an excuse. Um, again, it may be a little different overseas, but uh, in America, like they're, they're all over the place. Uh, you trip over them, at least in Jacksonville, you trip over them. Anybody else want to add something to this? Okay, follow-up question. You just mentioned, Brian, about the uh, chaplains. So should, this is a two-part question, and I realize this is a loaded question given who's in this room, but should a church planner make a connection with the chaplains, and should the church planner go through the chaplaincy to try to get, uh, to try to reach military families, warriors and their families? Do you have to do that? First question. Is it, is it good practice if you don't have to do it to, to go th- get connected with military chaplains and, and use that as the venue to access warriors and their families? Anybody, your thoughts? I'll, I'll start with the, the second. Well, when, no, you don't have to do anything, but what you should not ever do is make them all mad. And in terms of intentionally picking fights with people, uh, there is authority and that authority must be respected. And to sidestep authority around a base to get access just to, that no, it never makes friends. Um, not that you have to be friends with the chaplain, not that you, they'll, they're, they're not the only gatekeeper, but especially for an American side, when you're looking multiple years down the road, I don't want to make a decision now that will close a door in three years. A short-term gain is not worth a long-term sacrifice. And so I would say some chaplains are people of peace that will open the door for you. Some are and some of those that will are heretics all day long. And some of the ones who are the most closed off are the closest theological brothers there are. So it's just hard to know without just saying, hey, I love the people you're loving. Can I help you love them better? Or can I love them in a way that you don't have time to love them? Because as a chaplain, I do paperwork half the time. And so if someone wants to come on and say, hey, I'll do the ministry and you can count it on your OPR for you, then, um, hey, absolutely, I'll give you access to that. And so finding a way to love the people in the way the chaplain can't love them is a good thing to do. And so sometimes chaplains give access. Sometimes they don't. If they don't, not sidestepping them. That, I think, will just leave us. It'll, it'll scorch the earth for the next guy to come in, even when you go on. So... 
Hey, by the way, do us a favor and define acronyms. So tell everybody what an OPR is. OPR, sorry, your performance evaluation or your and fit rep. Leland, tell everybody what a PCS is. Yeah, it's a permanent change of station when you move from one duty station Thank to the you. other. Thank and you. I'll, I'll chime in there if you don't mind there for Jeff. Um, uh, here's what I'll say. Um, I reach out to chaplains first and foremost because they are service members. And just because they have a role of caring for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, um, they need encouragement. They need the gospel to be continually spoken to them, just like every other service member. As I build friendships with these people, as I invite them over for dinner, as I encourage them, as I help them when they're struggling with their marriages, as I try to be... um, a true friend in the gospel, if that leads to giving like this second pastor, we've been able to to work out some of those access points. But that can't be my motivation for speaking with that chaplain. And that's what I found is that the organizations that are here that reach out to them solely for their own benefit, instead of trying to create inroads of gospel conversations, gospel partnerships, when, when they reach out not looking for those types of partnerships, then they typically get the stiff arm because whether we like it or not, there's a what's in it for me aspect to this. And so just in my experience, which is purely in an overseas context at this juncture, I have found that just by simply reaching out to them purposefully, not as they are a gatekeeper per se, um, the chances of the gate opening becomes greater. And if it doesn't, then you have still stayed true to spreading the gospel no matter what. That's just my perspective. Anybody else want to add anything? Yeah, I would just say as somebody, you know, coming in from, from outside the military, that chaplains are a great resource to know your context, to learn from, um, you know, as a, as a missionary, you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, where do I meet people? How do I connect? What does that look like? And so I found uh, chaplains to be a great resource to just speak into to that and to learn from. Yeah, I think the other thing is to, a, a lot of time we talk about the pastor-chaplain connection, right? And actually sometimes that's, that's a little difficult because we're we are focused on our ministry and what God has called us to. But one thing we do as well is teach our people to support what the chaplains are doing, especially on deployments. So as guys are deployed on ship or guys are deployed in combat zones uh, and and in the pre-deployment discussions like, hey, you need to find out what is the chaplain doing and can you get behind it and support it? We have had guys lead Bible studies helping the chaplain. We've had guys lead worship uh, on ship and in Task Force Southwest in Afghanistan. We've had guys uh, help with leading worship. We've had guys do scripture readings and other aspects of the worship gathering when they're having chapel services on ship and uh, in Afghanistan. And so teaching guys to do that. Look, instead of starting something else Find out what the chaplain's doing, and if it's not heretical, then infuse that and get involved in it. If it is heretical, let's sign a lay leader letter and see if they'll allow you to start something off to the side to to minister to your faith group, uh, which is conservative evangelicals or however you want to classify that. Uh, I've found it's helpful to think of this uh, in terms of concentric circles. So the, there, if you use the base as the, the center of the circle. Uh, the chaplain, uh, by authority lines, as Justin was talking about, he really owns what's inside that wire and, and the responsibility to the commander for that relationship and what happens in that setting. Uh, he's responsible for advising the commander on what is allowed by, by DOD policy, in fact. Uh, so he needs to do his homework and know and understand that. But then there are... are uh, expanding circles beyond that wire, beyond the gate, if you will, like Brian was talking about a while ago, where these folks are interacting. About 70% of our population now in the military lives off post or off the base. That wasn't true 50 years ago. They had this, you know, kind of uh, world that that all existed all on the post, and they went to chapel there and that kind of stuff. Um, that's, that's different now. And 
they are choosing to live out in the communities, to be involved with their kids' schools and places like that. So you got to learn to look for where those pockets of gatherings are. Um, Brian didn't tell you this a while ago, but one of the hottest spots in uh, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, if you want to go meet my Marines, is a barbershop. Just go in there and sit down in a barbershop because they're getting a haircut every 7 to 10, 12, 14, 14 days, and you can interact with them there, eating places, other things like that. So you got to look for those. Where Leland uh, is connecting is a, there's a food court there on the base, and on the weekends, everybody comes in and piles into that food court around lunchtime and begins to connect and build community and interact. And you just plop yourself down in the midst of that and get a Subway sandwich and sit there, sometimes for two hours, because folks are coming and going in the midst of that, and you can interact. But you got to find out how to connect within those uh, concentric circles uh, and respect the the lanes and lines that exist uh, in regard to that. Uh, I'll tell you, and I haven't been a chaplain for a long time, you need to adopt a kingdom mindset. You don't need to be looking for what you're getting credit for uh, on, on that fitness report or the OPR. I mean, it's great if you can add that in there. Um, you can't do it all. The other realization as a chaplain, if you really understand the responsibilities of caring for the spiritual needs for folks, 800 to 1,000 people and their families or loved ones, that's more than one person can do most of the time. So adopt the team mentality. Bring other people into that fold and let God use those resources to extend the capabilities of, of facilitation and care in those concentric circles. Hey, can we just respect the fact that Endel just said concentric circles, but really what he's talking about is a bullseye. So, um, all right, so let's get highly specific for just a second. We're talking about how transient military families are. And we're talking about uh, developing a relationship with military chaplains, but those military chaplains move every couple of years. So do I have to repeat this thing every couple of years? First question. Second question. This, Justin, I'd, for, I'd like for you to start with this and then anybody else jump in there. How specifically, let's say you don't have any experience doing this, how, practically speaking, do you minister to the military family that's going to be gone in 24 to 36 months? If you got them early on, maybe they're gone in six months if you got them late in the game. So first question, do you have to keep doing this with military chaplains since they rotate every couple of years? Second question, how practically does a church planner do this in a transient community? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll start first and try to go a little bit broader and hopefully answer that. Uh, the reason we plant churches is because the people of God who love God, love his people and gather together to go do his mission. So we, does healthy disciples love the local church? I've yet to know a healthy disciple who did not love the local church, period. So therefore we have local churches to accommodate those kind of things. The natural overflow of good disciple making is local church. And I think what I've worked with so many over the last 10 years that are under the age of 30, almost every one of them craves stability outside the military transient mess. And so creating church that is stable and steadfast and consistently preaching the gospel is more um the, the smell is so sweet when it's compared to the constant changingness of the military. So I'd kind of start with that, that it's got to be stable. Um, and, the, and the church is the natural flow of good discipleship. The natural flow of being a missionary is to create a permanent church. It's not just to do the mission work. It's mission work that, that culminates in a church. And that church can stay past the time of, and can handle the, the transient waves of the military. And so... I think I answered like half that question. Is there any other? Okay. That Sorry was, about that. That was beautiful. I don't know how much of the question I answered, but that was, that was great. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anybody else? Do, how, do you, how do you do this revolving relationship with the chaplains that you're working with? How do you do this revolving relationship with the families that you're working with? The one thing I was going to say about families is there are so many different kinds because the military is a cross-country American society. Therefore, there's the intellectuals, the blue collars, and all kinds of things. And I've yet to find a consistent way of just the military. They don't fit into a thing. So I had to delve into the particular of that family. What is this family like? How do I love this family that's here? Not just the military as a whole. There's a line out of a, out of a, out of a book I just quoted the other day that the more I love a, a humanity in general, the less you love people in particular. 
And I want to be concerned with not just loving the idea of the military, but to love the particular people that show up. And when that's the case, I'm, a, I'm less concerned with pragmatically, a programmatically, I'm more concerned with how does this family get loved? And from there, it just kind of takes care of itself. Yeah, that's great. And so kind of practically, if you think, man, there's some cool stories of like, uh, one I'm thinking of is a guy by the name of Max Stiles planted a church in United Arab Emirates. Uh, and one of his first converts, former Muslim first converts, was at the church for 17 years that Mac planted. And then he turned the church over and the new convert from 17 years prior was the pastor that he turned it over to and he left the church, right? We all, like, what a great story. I plant a church. One of my first converts is the guy I turn over, the pastor at to when I leave, right? Just that's probably not going to happen in a military church plant, right? So what's going to happen is this guy who is lost, we, we want to see him saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, baptized into a local church. Beautiful. This person that was just saved, I want to see him in a discipling relationship and growing in Christ. This person who's been growing in Christ seeing them uh, start to lead a small group, lead a community group, or learn how to preach or learn how to lead worship or whatever those things are. But just understand that's going to be different people and you're going to bring them from here to here and then send them out. You're going to bring them from where they where you saw them to like the next thing and then send them out. Or you're just going to stabilize them. Their life is in crisis. You just stabilize them during a deployment instead of it all crashing man, that would be success, right? If some of them, instead of crashing and the ground falling out from under them during this life event, if you can just stabilize them for that season, that can be a win. And so just, I, I think changing the, what is a win? A win is either stabilizing or helping that person continue to grow for the season that you have them. Even if you never have that story of, man, a guy that I saw come to Christ 17 years ago became the pastor of the church that I planted. It's a great story. Man, it's a great story. But yeah. what we have seen is guys in our church raised up and then sent out to another church, then sent to another church, and we're finding out two churches later that they're becoming pastors. Like, that's exciting. And that's where you can see that what you what you made as a foundation shows fruit 10 years later and then becoming pastors or becoming elders in churches and, and that development process from, from new converts or recent converts or not even knowing what a healthy church looks like and coming into our context and being sent out with what little bit we can give them in a short time we have them to see them develop and, and become those people is, is amazing and it's awesome and it's, and, it's, and it's really cool. And as far as no one's answered your first question yet, so I'll answer it for you uh, I, the way that I think it should be. Yep. And uh, I believe that as you develop relationships with chaplains uh, in, in around your base and around the things that you're trying to do and develop those healthy relationships with those chaplains, they will tell you who the next guy is coming in. They'll, they'll, they'll set that for you. Hey, you need to meet. If you're important enough to their, their work and to their chaplaincy, they'll tell you who the next guy's going to be, and they'll give the next chaplain your name. And so that, that you're getting a text or a call, hey, I'm coming in. I'll be the next chaplain over 1-6. Uh, over and so uh, I, I would love to connect with you when you get in here. And, uh, and that's also where, where Nam can come in and, and begin to and help us along that process. So uh, Endel's getting ready to tell us what that looks like. Well, no, I, I just want to jump in there and, and say that there's tremendous value with that, and I would encourage you to connect with the chaplains and gatekeepers as we've talked about, but don't put all your eggs in that basket. If you have a great click and everything suddenly blossoms and you're going, oh, this is phenomenal. We're all the way in dead center of the bullseye. This guy's even letting us on base. And two to three years from now, next guy comes in, different personality, different faith background, or the commanding officer changes, uh, or you get a new JAG officer uh, a lawyer in the midst of that that looks at that thing differently and says, whoa, 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 we don't need to be doing that. And I've seen two situations over the last three or four years um, where rug was snatched out in a heartbeat and the morale of the church and the people involved, it, it was just tumultuous for them to, to, to get stabilized again and start moving forward. So, again, engage them well. A person of peace, I think, was the term that was used uh, in regard to that. Uh, but also keep your other paths and, and options open uh, as you're working through some of that. And sometimes the chaplain may be the uh, stalwart there. 
Uh, but there may be other people that you can touch. And sometimes it's a junior enlisted person that you connect to and they got access. All they need is an ID card. And then suddenly you can go in there in partnership and you're walking alongside them as a friend and a spiritual leader. And they'll begin to introduce to you lots of folks. So don't just think about the top stratosphere. Look at all the levels where God might open those doors for you. Uh, the other thing I'll tap on uh, kind of the previous piece is the intentionality that's unique to this effort. Uh, we've been planting churches around military installations forever. Military believers have been moving in and as, as a desire to connect and to have community, those a lot of those established churches now outside of military installations were generated by people who were, they didn't know they were doing church planting. And a lot of times it was in response to their own need or desire to have church. But out of that, it began to unfold. What we've got to do is be intentional about this network of discipleship we're talking about so those handoffs can occur. So this guy can 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 win somebody to the Lord and, and get him started down the path. Two or three years later, this guy's picking him up and beginning to disciple and take him into depth so he understands what tithing is and all those other commitments and walk it right on out. So over a 20-year career, this person continues to grow, and we've not had that for the most part with our military believers. They're just flopping around everywhere trying to find something. So, Okay, uh, question for you, Leland. So I hope everybody in the room understands, even in uh, overseas assignment, a warrior is going to get sent over, uh, he's going to be sent on deployment, or she's going to be sent to uh, training, which leaves a military family. And we're talking right now about the unique practicalities of ministering to a military family. So Leland, tell us what that looks like for you with those American families that are living in Vincenza, Italy, and their spouse is now sent uh, to a combat zone and they're left alone with you. How do you do that? Yeah, so um, that actually happens tomorrow. Um, we will have almost every man in our church at this juncture pull out of town on a uh, training exercise. Um, and they will spend an extended amount of time away from their families. And um, I have been meeting with those men, trying to prepare them for the desert that they're headed into. But we also, we kind of call it targets of opportunity. And so uh, we call it targets of opportunity because seasons like this are pretty regularly. Brian mentioned that 50% of the time, uh, these, these service members are going to be out of town. And so 50% of the time, that mom is going to be trying to play both mom and dad. That dad will try to be playing both mom and dad and the struggles that comes with that. And so um, we intentionally plan. We pay attention to the calendar that's here. And we look at, okay, so what we need to do is we need to ramp up a few things. So um, like in our scenario, we have some ladies who are uh, biblically uh, counseling trained. And so we have set up um, three days a week to where during this time, the women are available to come in and uh, talk to these other women to be discipled and counseled at the same time. We have um, some of just some of those resources, if you will. And then the others is we create intentional kind of pop-up communities. So we take some of our more experienced women and they create times for coffee and, uh, you know, they're going to start a little Bible study on the side and some of these other things. And then the men who are left, we prepare for, you know, what we call Murphy. Um, you know, what can go wrong will go wrong. Your car runs fine until your husband pulls out of town and now all of a sudden uh, you can't get anything to work. And so those men that are left kind of move into these helping hands modes to where um, in pairs of twos, we go and we begin to help out different scenarios. These are just some of the intentional ways that we'll do it target of opportunity wise. Um, and then the other way is that we are intentional. We, we are here um, every Sunday. Um, while the men are gone, we've got a team coming out from uh, Colorado that's going to do a women's conference. Um, and all of these things just kind of spin around the idea of stability and intentionality. Um, and that's just what we try to do. And when they're home, we actually try to back off. We try to give them a little extra time with their families. Uh, we try to create space for uh, what is a healthy rhythm in this, you know, to coin the phrase tribal family. Um, what does it look like? What does it look like to, to have a, um, a good exit plan for, okay, intentionally we're sending daddy or mommy, but also what does it look like to intentionally to receive daddy and mommy back into the house? 
And so we want to help them create those rhythms so that it's not disruptive to the kids and um, it's, it's not too damaging, if you will, in their family reality. Those are just a few things. Hopefully I didn't talk too much. Those are great suggestions. Um, one or two more questions, and then I'm going to open it up to you to ask questions of the panel. Uh, this one is directed towards Barry, but anybody after Barry can answer this one. So how does your sending church or your home church support you as you start to get down the road into developing uh, church planting in a military community? How how does that look for you? Um, that's, that's an interesting question for me because we... We landed the the Little River Baptist Association was really key. Um, we didn't have one church that felt like they were completely able to sponsor and support, which is one reason to plant churches. We're not just planting churches, but we're planting churches who are going to send and plant more churches. And so, so that's that's the goal. Um, so, man, I you know I think obviously the obvious things are prayer. Um, Financial resources is a piece. Uh, just, just the, you know, some of the things we missed out on. I think is just that steady, you know, home base. Hey, how are things going? What's going on with your family? What's going on in your life? That sort of thing. That I think we got a little bit of that from the association, but I think that sort of thing could have been really, um, if you if you have a sending church where there's that real deep relationship. So uh, that's something that we kind of look at. And uh, I think even more um, is that resident or apprenticeship where somebody can go in. I know Pillar does a great job with this, can go in, be there, learn, grow in the midst of the laboratory, and then be sent out so that there's kind of an understanding of what to expect. So, Anybody else? And I'll add after doing a couple of church plants, uh, financial stability allows for so much spiritual development to happen. And I know that you can't just directly tie financials with spiritual faithfulness, but if there can't be financial stability, it makes it really hard to not to to not focus directly on the ministry. And I find that God always fi- funds His mission no matter what. He always, there's always money for his mission. Sometimes we have to be the ones that go out and, and be the connecting the dots between God's mission and the actual money showing up. But if I can't raise money for the work to be done, I'm going to have a really hard time doing the actual work that I want to do. And so I think there's a direct correlation between financial stability and ascending church that provides the lead gift to that, or they say, I'm going to, we're backing you financially, man, that goes a long way in confidence to do the work. And so I find if that doesn't happen, there's a lot of instability that goes on in the planter's life. When everything's going great, you don't need a sending church. Here's the problem. That's just not going to happen very often that everything's going to be going great all the time. Um, The other thing is we we just started preaching through the book of Acts in our church. I know you're supposed to do that when you like start the church, but we're like six and a half years in and are preaching through Acts. But um, I don't think we just started, but I don't think we're going to find an individual planting a church by themselves. I just don't think it's in the book of Acts. Again, I've read it many times. Haven't preached through it yet, except for the very first sermon, but uh, I just don't think it's in there. What I do think you see is churches sending out, interesting, it's almost always two people, to go support evangelistic dust that has been kicked up, to disciple and form it into a local church. that's what you're going to see in the book of Acts. I contend that's why we say things, taglines, churches plant churches. Churches plant churches. I believe it's the biblical pattern. Um, And so churches plant churches, and there's a reason for it. Um, You need the stability, like Justin just said. Uh, You need the stability, and it's everything. Financial stability, emotional stability, the ability to weather the storms of life and ministry. Uh, One example, I was sitting around the table with uh, some of the pastors of my sending church. Uh, I was called 
and sent out by one church. Like I was called in the midst of my sending church and they sent me out. They ordained me. They did everything. And, uh, Life was difficult because we were the only people. JD said when he moved down, we were 95% active duty military. Guess who the 5% was? My family. <laughs> that was it. I was not active duty anymore. And uh, I sat around and I was like, look, it's tough. Like, I don't know how we're going to do this 100% military families. I just don't know how it's going to happen. And JD asked a very poignant question. He said, how's Kelly doing? That's my wife. How's she doing in this? And I said, it's even harder for her that everyone that she knows and is befriending will not live there. And it's not like the military. She's, she's not in the military where she's in the inside anymore. Now she's on the outside watching all of it. And so he gave me a call or an email or something a month later and said, well, what would it look like for us to move down there? And so that all happened because of an active involved sending church. Uh, and it is necessary. If things are going to go bad, if you're going to like – parachute in and do it all perfect, you probably don't need ascending church. You got it. Uh, but if you're imperfect and you anticipate any speed bumps along the way, you need ascending church and you need partners around you and you need a team effort. Hey guys, thanks for using the parachute illustration this close to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, one last question. So you've kind of hinted around about it. If, I hope you guys have all heard this from the panel today. The worst part about doing military ministry is the folks that you fall in love with are going to move. The greatest part about military ministry is that person that's driving you absolutely nuts. They're going to move. So everybody's going to move. It's pretty transient. And the last question for everybody on the panel is, how successful are you really going to be as a church planner in a heavily populated military community if you're only thinking about you and your church and are not really focused on building Jesus's church. In other words, if you don't have a kingdom mindset, how's this thing going to go for you? Anybody? I mean, I, the whole evaluation of ministry is boils down to faithfulness. And if I'm faithful, it always comes around. The Lord seems to create stability, but it, you don't ever know if, if a church falls apart, that God's will, is it booms and goes explodes, that God's will, I don't know. All I know is that faithfulness to the calling, not just having faith, but being faithful, like responding to the faith I have is the, is the act that I can measure from. And if whatever the Lord recognizes his movement, I respond to that, I have faith that he's moving, I'm faithful in my response, then I find the Lord always provides the, the encouragement and the stability to make it happen. So, uh, I'll weigh in here just really quick. Um, so, one of the taglines for Pillar Churches usually is we care more about our sending capacity than our seating capacity. Uh, it means that we care more about how we can send out missionaries and disciples into the world than we care about those who are gathering in our churches. Yes, we want to gather more people so that we can send out more missionaries, uh, but we're not going to be. Um, so focused on ourselves and growing ourselves that we're going to go and, and do things that we feel like are against our, uh, against our kind of methodology of how we want to reach and disciple guys and men and women in the church. And so, um, and so we, we care a lot about, we, we've, the Lord has never left us without enough people to pastor. Um, I can say that. And, uh, even, even when, we, even when we saw 10 families leave in the last two months, um, we still were not void of families that were, were going through uh, needs of counseling and marriage and difficulties or things like of that nature. So uh, there's always people to counsel and pastor and, and love. And in the midst of that, he's brought 10 more families that are, are needing the same things. Uh, and so just the nature, of, the nature of, of what we do. But yeah, definitely not thinking more of, of ourselves and how we can gather more people, more about shepherding the ones that come and, and reaching those who are lost in the community. That's what we uh, that's what a healthy church, I believe, does anyway. Yeah. Amen. I, um, I want to tap on something that in our language that we're using here today uh, as we think about the New Testament. Uh, first of all, uh, Brian, let me encourage you to read through the book of Acts. Notice you'll discover that Paul was the first Navy chaplain. As you go through that, <laughs> as far as capabilities. Uh, as you. Do you, okay, as you continue to read, we, we got it documented. <laughs> uh, what I'll say to you in the midst of the, the momentum about that is as we talk about affirming church, uh, and, and again, I'm a big local church guy, Jesus talks about church a few times in the New Testament. 
but he talks about the kingdom of God over 200 times. I mean, you can go do the search and find out yourself. So uh, as much as we put emphasis on church and what that provides for us, we always have to keep our minds set on the eternal horizon as it relates to the kingdom of God. And I think even in this room, as we think about the various roles we play and stuff, uh, as a chaplain, what I've experienced uh, many times over the years is that many times uh, I'm jumping in to hurt whatever it is, and I'm trying to help stabilize that person and to walk them out of that hurt a little bit. The other thing that's going on is I get to be a seed planter in the midst of that. And uh, I get to to offer them some insights and walk them as far as they're willing to go. And sometimes that's one or two conversations, depending on the dynamics of the flow of what's going on in their lives and the transient part. In combat, I've met people one time and had a conversation for five minutes. Uh, and, and, and off and away, I'm going to the next thing. And as I walk away, I have to pray, say, Lord, put somebody else in their life. That'll water that and grow that to fruition because that's, that's the only touch I'm probably going to get. Um, and I need churches outside of those installations and folks that are connecting that I can refer to and hand people off to in that resourcing that I can trust and know that they're going to give them the Word of God and invest in their lives and care for their families along that path to reach the, that kingdom fruition which we're interested in. And I think sometimes we have to back off our egos in relation to that, um, or even our own sense of responsibility to say, I'm going to do all of this, again, because I, I don't know that you can, and you really have to trust God with some of those endeavors. And then what you'll see, go back to this transient piece, you'll find people that will come back into your lives, at least if you hang around as long as I have. There are people that have come back into my lives and stuff, and they, they'll tell me things that I said or that I did that I had no intentional awareness of that God bore fruit into their lives over time. Billy Royal, who was here yesterday, some of y'all got to meet Billy. Uh, he and I served in Iraq together, and we had a bad day one day, and he was in charge of that, um, that convoy, and he lost seven people that day. And I happened to walk in the chapel and saw him sitting over there. I could tell something about his demeanor. I didn't know all of what was going on with him, but he was the staff sergeant and rolling that convoy. And I walked in and just sat down and, and talked with him a little while. And he said, he said, man, you, you pulled me out of, you know, where I was going down a very dark, deep hole at that moment. And it's amazing that lunch, and then we compared it to lunch yesterday where we sat and ate the food that was provided here by Southeastern and talked about what God has done in our lives and brought us over that momentum. So uh, just, just keep that in mind and that perspective and trust God with it. Folks, you've heard about uh, having a, maybe a slightly different definition of success as a church planner in a military community um, because really what you're doing is you're building the kingdom, not just building a church. Before I open the, the floor up to questions, I'd like to give Chaplain Carver a chance to add some input. He doesn't know that I'm going to do this, but sir, if you don't mind, would you at least paint a picture for just a brief moment for folks that may be considering planning a church in a military community? Would you paint a picture of how a local church can really have a global impact if you plant in a military town? I think the local church needs, and I think JD, you mentioned it. You've got to, you've got to learn the vernacular. Uh, but I, I'm surprised as I travel around to a lot of churches, and they do not understand the culture of the military, from um, rank structure, the life of the military, the whole authority issue, the deployments, the movements, uh, the demographics of the families who are, first of all, most of our prime meat, if you will, is the 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, uh, that's the prime candidates. And, and then we have a very young military, um, young married. So we're, we're dealing with uh, young people who, who are still maturing in their skills uh, as, a, as a young married couple, as a, as a parent, as a, in many cases as a single parent when uh, mom or dad is deployed. Um, as a spouse who has to remain back and maintain all the household from budgeting to uh, changing the oil in a car, mowing the grass, and uh, not having any family members anywhere close by, those are some of the things I think that the, you know that the local church needs to realize that within your footprint, um, how far is Bragg from here? So I'm, I mean, I, I could arguably say, you know, probably you probably have. I'm, there are probably some some uh, soldiers who are commuting 
from this far. Is that right? And, and, and so you, I think you, you have to look at that military. Uh, it, is a, it is a community. Pro part of the problem with the military community, it is, it is somewhat of a closed community. Uh, you may eventually get access, but it, it is a closed community. Now, the, good, the good news, and you've already caught up, 85%. When I came in the military in 1973, uh, most of the folks lived on post. Now we're, now we're pushing 80, 85% maybe living off, off post. So you already have military family members living in your neighborhood. And the other thing I tell local churches, having gotten out of the military, looking for a local church, Keith Travis told me, he says, the hardest thing you're going to do once you leave is to find a local church. And I, I cannot tell you the number of churches, Southern Baptist churches that I sat in, walked out before the, uh, even the sermon started in some cases because it was just a cold, unwelcoming place. Something has happened with the church. You know, we talk about closed community. The church is somewhat a closed community and hard to crack. Uh, so I would, I would tell pastors and I would tell uh, local churches that they do need to reach out to this unique uh, people group, which, again, I've said before, arguably is one of the most unreached people groups in the United States. Um, that's, that's what, and there is, there is a need. Um, our troops are hungry for, uh, uh, for the truth. They're hungry for relevance. They're interested and hungry for spirituality. They're hungry for community. Now, tell me, tell me one church of Jesus Christ that can't provide that. Uh, some religious groups, I was just out at uh, Brigham Young in Salt Lake City a few weeks ago, uh, they've cracked the code on it uh, in, in their community. I mean, they are proactive in anybody new that coming, you know, comes into the community. So I, I would say the local church has to really start looking at who their community is. Now, again, we're a, I don't know if we even use the term nuclear community anymore, but people are going to come to your church, and they may not live anywhere close by. But what can that local church pastor um, and, and all of the, the elders and the people do to look out for the needs of our military. I, I could go down the list of things that, that, that are really critically important, but we do need to be a military caring church. We, we need to be caring churches and reach, reaching out to people. I, I would imagine uh, all of you have had that, seen that experience. I mean, there's, there's a loneliness out there, and uh, we, ha we have something to build community among our um uh, our, our military folks, many of them who are retired. Um, what I wanted to say is uh, in 2013, when you, well, when we sat down with Kevin after some cultural changes in the military, and uh, we even had some senior uh, SBC leadership that were saying we have come to a, we're coming to a red line where maybe we can have a discussion about not sending endorsed Southern Baptist chaplains into the armed services. Um, I would have probably thrown down my, my rank on that one uh, because we still have 20% of the armed services are Southern Baptist. 20%. So they still need a faithful gospel presence. And this is where Kevin Ezell said, hey, we need to have a faithful gospel presence near every military base and community in the world. Now, that is a God vision. Uh, and it, and only God can pull that one off. So uh, that's basically what I have to say. I, I also want to say to the chaplains in this room, you know, at some point you're going to take your uniform off, either from retirement uh, or uh, health reasons, and I hope that you never lose the, uh, the passion uh, for, our, for our veterans and families. Um, they they need your they need your leadership skills and your pastoral care uh, in in these places and I just I, I commend y'all for the uh, for what's happened with Pillar uh, Leland I mean I'm uh, it's hard to believe that we're talking to a guy sitting over in in Italy you know who's advancing the kingdom and, and it's a military church plan uh, but this is what God is doing and uh, Endel if you're not gonna well you're gonna probably share that we we you know we have fourteen sixteen Strong military church plants largely do, uh, again, uh, to, uh, through Pillar's efforts. But we've got a bunch on the horizon. I'll say, I'll say 10 or 12 on the horizon that could actually uh, launch in 2020. Um, last of all, John Brinsfield, former uh, Army historian, retired 
06. He said that he, he, he sees spiritual awakening happening, and it's going to happen within the context of chaplaincy ministries. Well, that's why you need to hang around the chaplains as well, because, I mean, whether, whether you like them or not, and some of them are heretics, I, I know, <laughs> hopefully no Southern Baptists are, but you got to deal with them, if nothing more than put them at the top of your prayer list, uh, because I personally believe you got an 06 sitting at a base, uh, you you got to deal with them in some respects spiritually because I God has planted that mantle of spiritual authority. They're, they are a gatekeeper. Uh, I think Justin, you mentioned it. I mean, you can really blow this thing up and burn a bridge for the rest of any uh, military church plant that's going to be near that base. You got to deal with them. Um, if, if nothing more, pray for them and you know take them a candy corn or something. I don't know, but do something with them. Uh, to show. And and the last thing I would add to a local church. If you were to tell, uh, if you were to tell a military commander something that was a value added to the life, the resilience, the strength, the combat readiness of their uh, of their warrior and family member, if I were a commander or you know the mayor of a military community, I would listen. And so, so my challenge, you know, to yeah, a lot of can I ask them a question? Uh, what what is your value added to your respective base where you're serving now? If I if if I invited you into my office as the uh, commanding uh, general or whatever admiral, what is your value added to my troops? That's rhetorical. <laughs> no, I, th I, th I think he does want an articulate response. I think he's looking for an articulate response to this question. I'll, I'll answer your question. Uh, the value added for a commander on a secular articulation is that the biggest problems every commander has have to do with personnel issues and personal drama in their house. And I can help sustain or, or squash some of that and create the... the, the the fabric, strong fabric at home that prevents the kind of problems that gives the commanders the biggest headache. So all I want to do is take headaches off your head, off your mind in order to, to keep people from having as many problems. And I think that is the value added. It's like bangs are going to happen. I want to care for people before the bang so that they settle after the bang. So. Yeah, I think the other side of that is also to, uh, we would use the word minister, but to care for the families uh, so that the service members can focus on the mission. Um, the other thing we do is, in, a, in so many ways, we pick up the pieces to allow the commander to focus on the mission. I really do believe in the mission of the U.S. military, especially when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and we, in a lot of ways, pick up the pieces. Uh, so there's family struggles that go along with defending, uh, supporting and defending the Constitution, uh, and there's really not a way to get around that. I don't want them to sacrifice the mission to so that our families stay intact. We, as a church, should be helping families stay intact and give people emotional, spiritual resiliency to be able to go and do what needs to be done to to support and defend democracy, and then um, to pick up the pieces. There are there is a wake behind the military uh, of broken families, broken marriages, and fatherless children. And we help pick up the pieces, I believe, to allow the mission to continue um, as long as the mission remains valid. And I think it still does.